The week's other big news happened on Tuesday as hundreds of thousands of New Mexicans cast votes in the state's primaries. There's a lot to unpack here, so let's get to it. Joining us this week are UNM political science professor Lana Atkinson. She's been watching both the voting process and the results closely. Line regular and former House Minority Whip Daniel Foley is back with us to help us sort through the races. We're very pleased to have another line regular, Tony Laura Sanchez. She's returning for another spin. Laura, good to have you. All right, progressives had themselves a night. After the dust settled, they unseated key conservative Senate Democrats, including John Arthur Smith and Senate President Pro Tem Mary Kay Pabin. Still Democrats in these seats most likely come November, but Laura, it changes the face of the political makeup of the Senate, doesn't it? It's very interesting. It does. Um, it will change the face. Uh dramatically, I think, because many of these uh, incumbents that were unseated were chairs mm -hmm. of respective Senate committees. So we're talking about a whole new group one way or the other. Um, and so you saw a big wave of uh, definitely progressive candidates that took out Democrat incumbents who are more conservative. Mm -hmm. but whether they actually will be able to win in, in November is a different question. And I think a lot has to do with the turnout, the presidential election, and frankly, whether there is, uh, is still an, a vote by mail uh, plan if we're still sort of uh, dealing with COVID issues at that point. Um, but I think more than a progressive, uh, I mean, I, I think you, you have to recognize that there's a progressive uh, wave, but there was also an anti-incumbent wave because if you look at some of the conservative districts, for example, Greg Fulfer down in, um, in Jowl in Lee County, Senator Fulfer was unseated also by David Gallegos in the House. So that was not the progressive thing. It was a sort of anti-incumbent thing. Good point. So, um, and you saw some of that around the country with um, some congressional congressional members, uh, Republican members who were also unseated. So I think there was definitely a wave of of change um, uh, going through this last Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Lana, I want to get to the ramifications for the general coming up here in just a little bit. I want to hold you on that for just a quick sec. I'm curious your thoughts, though, on the impact of votes for things like repealing criminalization of abortion. That was out there, of course. There was a very impactful vote. Uh, that sort of drove that marijuana, early childhood education. There were a lot of things on the table that folks wanted to see happen. Is that essentially what drove this as well? Yeah, I mean, I think the abortion issue in the Senate was obviously what drove this. A lot of money was poured into those contests. So there were uh, lots more money spent on the uh, new candidates running against the incumbents uh, than we had seen previously. Lots of digital ads, lots of mailers. There's a lot of activity around this. It didn't just focus on the abortion issue, mm -hmm. um, but I believe that that was the main issue, obviously, that led to the, uh, the interest in those, in those senators and also to the, their defeat. Mm -hmm. Daniel, pick up on that if you would. And I got a couple of Republican uh, results for you I want to ask you about too, but go ahead and pick up on where Democrats came in when it comes to um, these huge names that are suddenly not a part of our reality anymore. It's very interesting to kind of get your head around that. <laughs> What's your well, thought you know, on that? If you're, if you're a Democrat, if you're a chairman of the Democrat Party of New Mexico right now, you might want to be careful what you wish for, right? I mean, the, it's clear that the Democrat Party is moving to the left, becoming more and more progressive, which is fine. We've witnessed this in the Republican Part, Party when we moved ultra right and became, you know, with the Christian coalitions, doing the things they were doing. Um, abortion was a big issue back then as well, right? And, uh, you know, there were legislators that came in and all of a sudden, you know, the moderate folks start thinking, you know, I'm really not down with this. So, you know, I would tell you it's races like uh, John Arthur Smith, seats like Mary Kay Papin, seats like Clemente Sanchez, those are not seats that Republicans normally have a chance to go after with those incumbents. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, never mind about the Democrats, are the Republican fielding good candidates? I mean, if you're feeling someone that moved in to Deming three months ago, or you're feeling somebody that lives at the furthest outlier reaches of the, of the district, you're not going to win. Now, if you've got some homegrown individual from Deming or someone from the center of Las Cruces or someone that actually lives in Grants, New Mexico, running as a Republican, you might have a chance to capture a seat right now. The mm -hmm. question is, does the Republican Party put the time in to go out and get the right candidates for an opportunity like this? Or are they just putting folks up? My concern is uh, the Republican Party has shown that, you know, their idea, their ideology right now was let's get someone to run for every seat. And when you get the when you have the plan of getting someone to run for every seat, you usually wind up getting anybody that will run. Right. Hey, Dan, staying with you a quick sec, if you can keep this uh, fairly brief. I'm interested in, uh, Laura mentioned David Gallegos, and there's the Greg Schmidt's situation. Um, there were some Republican senators that got upset. What, what was your take on that? 
So first of all, I can't believe you came to me and said, keep it brief, but I'll try. Um, you know, I think, I think there's a couple of things, right? The first one is uh, you've got the, the uh, James White, which was a sitting senator getting beat by a sitting representative, I believe, or someone that had been in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So it's not someone that's a no name. Right. Uh, down in Hobbs, you got the Fulford deal. Um, you know, it's clear that, you know, the, the Senator Fulford was a Democrat four or five years ago who switched parties and Steve Pierce and the Republican Party was not in favor of him. So, you know, look, regardless of whether you agree with parties, disagree with parties, if the party machine is behind you in a primary, you got a pretty good chance of winning the primary. It's the question is, can that party machine carry you through the general election? Gotcha. Lana, now I want to ask you about ramifications for Republicans on some of those high profile seats, especially down south. And Dan's take that, you know, be careful what you wish for. What's your sense of the possibilities in November? Well, I mean, you know, I, I agree that we've definitely sort of extended and expanded polarization in those areas mm -hmm. by you know, fielding more progressive candidates and, and definitely a conservative area. You can see the conservative, how conservative even Donyan is when they just barely passed a measure to, you know, wear masks. Right. Um, so there was a lot of opposition to that. So there, this is a very conservative area. It's, most conservative area of New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so you, we can expect a, a very large fight in the general. Now, I have not looked at those candidates either um, that the Republicans put up, and I do not know their qualities, and that's something that I, I, I need to look into because I gotcha. think that is an important point. Are there good candidates? Did they feel good candidates? Did they think that those races would be lost? I do want to mention that uh, turnout was up, up, up in New Mexico, especially for Republicans. Turnout for Republicans um, at least – we're still counting votes, so I'm not certain, but they were ahead of Democrats by about a point, and turnout was about 38% uh, for both parties if we combine them. So turnout was really up in this primary, which is amazing given that we really didn't have much competitive stuff going on. Isn't that something? That's very interesting. We'll see what happens when more numbers come out. Of, I think today, as we take this on Thursday, and certainly by the end of the week, that's interesting. Laura Sanchez, let's look at some federal races. Uh, CD3, Teresa. Ledger Fernandez won, and she beat a very high profile, well, uh, quite a few competitors, but obviously Valerie Plame was the most high profile. What was your take on the, on the race there? Well, I think certainly having, I, I lost count, I think it was like seven people in the race, um, right. <laughs> that the margin that you need to, to win by is, is much lower. I mean, you basically need to make sure that your votes are identified early, that you move them, that you continue to not lose ground with them. And I think that you know, in terms of the party apparatus, I mean, Teresa Ledger Fernandez was very active um, in the party for a long time. She had been um, working the party, I should say, the party regulars. Um, so I remember uh, meetings going back pretty far where she had um, surrogates that were coming in and talking to people and trying to get support for her at a variety of events. And that's always helpful when you have um, that much of, a, of an operation early on. I don't remember ever seeing any Valerie Plame, any, anyone sort of supporting her. Um, at some of those early, early meetings. And so that's an important sign, I think. Um, I Still, given that, it was hard to tell given all of the different um, commercials. If you don't live in that district, it was really hard to see who was gonna come out. But I think talking to people who live in that district who are very active Democrats, they weren't entirely surprised. I think for me, um, what was also interesting is down south and what's shaping up, um, given that that's you know, my home district down there. Um, now that we have um, you know the Republican uh, field set. Um, it's going to be a rematch of last uh, last election um, between Yvette Harrell and Suchil Torres Small. And so it's going to be uh, a very interesting, I think turnout will be high because of that, but also the presidential. And I think that's going to have an effect also on these uh, legislative races. So I agree with what uh, Dan and, and Lana have said as far as um, candidates. I do know just because I have an interest in the, in the Deming race, and I, I mean, I don't think there's any Surprise that I personally really respected and and I can say loved um, Senator Smith and and I'm just hating seeing him go. I mean, he's been in that office uh, since I was uh, like 14. <laughs> um, hey, you know, I, I, Dan Boyd in the journal made mention that there was 82 years of legislative combined experience that went out the door. Yeah, it was. And I mean, that means years. a lot. That's amazing. So for, yeah. for those districts, it means a lot. It's really going to change um, the legislature in general, regardless of who comes out. You lose someone with that much experience and it's just going to, I mean, you know, I, I used to cynically say. Can, can, I, I, can, I, can I hold you there? Yeah, I'm just running a little tennis. I want to get yeah. Lana in here real quick. Lana, can I get you to pick up on the Yvette Harrell race, the uh, Social Tourist Small race? Is the second time a charm for Ms. Harrell? 
uh, it's you know it's going to be another close contest yeah um hopefully we won't have the kind of aftermath that we had last time but i think that it really is going to depend a lot i mean does the president come in and and spend a lot of money in new mexico um as he indicates he might and what is the impact of that on those races um clearly the republican party is jazzed in a way that it was not jazzed in 2016 in particular mm -hmm. um so it, it's going to be a clear competitive and exciting contest Gotcha. Daniel, one last one. Um, Mark Ronchetti, what are we to make of his margin of victory? Does it portend something for his race against Ben Ray Lujan, or is this just the primary? No, I mean, you, got, you, got, you got Mark Ronchetti, who was on TV with name recognition at the Yahoo to start. <clears throat> you have all the other candidates, zero little name recognition. Alicia uh, had great name recognition in a very small segment of the Republican Party, the pro-life movement. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, listen, I am going to lay down this bet right now. Okay. You're going to see some of the funniest snafu and commercials in the U.S. Senate race you've ever seen between Ben Ray Lujan and Mark Ronchetti when all this stuff gets going. Those two guys are going to, it's going to be interesting to see what happens and how they go after him and what they're going to do on both sides. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, you know, turnout was a big thing. I mean, the, the Republican primary was the largest turnout, I think, ever in a primary we've had in this country in, in New Mexico in the history of keeping track of this, which is interesting news. It is. We're gonna have to follow up on that next week. I think Lana's touched on this. I think there's something going on out there right under our noses. Very interesting. We'll have to leave it there for now.